and that's as far as the wrestling did. What I did was I intimidated a lot of people. In your school go, out at, uh, and isn't it in Vegas? Fold, so swole that I can't get this I guess you can't hear me. Can you hear so me, ladies I'm gentlemen? sorry, say that again? Is, is your school in Vegas? I can hear you. Okay, yes, is sir. your school in Vegas? <laughs> yes, sir. Now, who's all the boys that hang out there and run that thing? Uh, so it's uh, me and Kenny King, D'Lo Brown, okay. and then... Uh, one of, one of my students, uh, uh, Chris Bay, and uh, TJP uh, pops in there. And then uh, we used to have Jake all the time, Jake the Snake, but he's now in Atlanta. Um, and then we have guest seminar people come in all the time. So at any given night of the week, five nights a week, we've got some pretty pretty uh, experienced coaches. So that's that's pretty cool. That's cool. Diversi that's diversity. Cool. I think awesome. it's a spice of life, you know. Well, you know what? What's so funny is when I hear you talk, I feel like I'm except except for the not as much cussing. It feels like I'm talking through your mouth or whatever. You're well, saying I, all this I, shit. You're saying all this shit it's the way it's supposed to be said. Well, I appreciate that very much. I'm flattered that you would uh, say that and think that. And I'll just jump into this, just the full thing. Like uh, boys and girls listening, I got no reason to blow smoke on anybody, but I will tell you all: Rip Rogers is the coach of coaches taught us right taught us how to feel and think and then uh, apply what we wanted to do and so when when, when i'm teaching i mean uh, you know it, it's it's my organic experiences but that's combo plattered with rip rogers dr tom al snow jake the snake dusty road so i mean not too bad of a pedigree to learn it from I, i'd have to be uh, a, f a full idiot to not be able to absorb any knowledge from these guys and rip rogers taught me so much that I can't even, I just, while you got your listeners on, I want to thank you, my friend. You were just awesome. Shit. I ought to fucking have you as a public service announcement or something like that. <laughs> Instead well, of like, me being a, 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 a pervo weirdo, you got the, you're the, the, the warlord of weird or whatever, but you talk normal and you know how to do all school, old school wrestling. And to me, that's what it's all about. And everybody else can kiss my motherfucking ass. <laughs> Am I allowed I'm to with, cuss on this thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm allowed to cuss on this. So you know, uh, it, it's it's fun. It's funny because a lot of times I so I work smart and hard. I don't, you know, if, if a match needs uh, ten bumps, I'll bump twelve times. If a match needs zero bumps, I'll bump one time. But uh, point being, I'm being silly. But point being is, as I go out and I work, and I was taught to work from you know you and ron hutchinson and jake the snake and dr tom and so forth and so when i get out there i'll have guys come into the locker room and kind of playfully get hot go man i took a thousand bumps you took one bump and your bump got more of a reaction than my thousand bumps i said well, yeah i know how to work yeah and they just always kind of giggle and they kind of try to figure out what that means and a lot of times when you're i mean as you would know when you're talking to young guys and girls they maybe say they want to learn, but I think they just say that as a tool to kind of uh, half-ass get over with you. But I'm like, if you want to learn, then open your ears and eyes and actually listen and implement what you're hearing. Don't just let the coach talk and think that's what's going to get you over. Like, you know, like uh, apply what we're teaching. That might well, be a trick. You know? When you've experienced the sensational and intelligent mass thunderbolt, in Toronto, yes, sir. It doesn't get it. It doesn't get any yes, better sir. than that. <laughs> the sensational no, sir. and intelligent mass thunderbolt. I will tell Ron you Hutchinson. a very flattering story. A very flattering story from Ron Hutchinson was I hadn't seen him for quite a few years. When after I left his, uh, like I, I did my basics there. I, I got my basic training from uh, Ron Hutchinson, and then I had traveled into the states, and I hadn't seen him for quite a few years, and then. I had a seminar at Cauliflower Alley Club, and I don't know, there was about 100 people in that seminar, and I did not know that Ron was kind of hiding in that seminar. And he came over to me afterwards and gave me a big hug with a tear in his eye and said, uh, boy, you make me proud. You know more than I do now. And we both kind of teared up and hugged, and it was, it was uh, such a flattering moment to know that my, my coach was, was now my peer. And I just, I, to me, that's better than any championship belt, you know, have, having uh, you know, somebody I look up to, you know, just, uh, you know, talk to me on, on equal terrain. I think that's so inspiring and flattering and, and I can't describe it. That's wild. That's awesome. Who, who'd you, um, was it Gail Kim? Is that who you talked to about? She started with him, did she? Is that who you started with? 
I tr- yeah. I, uh, so my opening class was my the, the guys and girls that I started with was I think just about every guy dropped out because Hutchinson pushed us so hard, which is good by me. I I, I would like to see the the the, the weak ones and the, the the prima donnas weeded out. Um, but the it was me and Gail Kim and Trish Stratus. We were the only the only three divas oh, wow. that made it through the whole bit. All the other dudes just dropped like flies. That's wild. I did not. I didn't know that. That's awesome. I bet you yeah, was I took, fluffed. 20, I bet you were fluffed twenty four hours a day when you was training down there. Oh my goodness! I, I when when you're you know I, I'm a respectful guy, but I mean I do have eyes. So you know training <laughs> tra- tra- training training with with Gail and, and Trish. You know, at, at my first glance, you know, of course my my male eyes are looking at at, uh, at these two uh, wonderful ladies, but I soon realized that these two these two ladies had more balls than all the other dudes put together. Like they, they, as we would say in the snow, they were goers. They, they did not ever give up. They'd always, you know, wipe their, wipe their brow and say, keep on going. Let's go. And, uh, they're, they're awesome. With that being said though, if, if those two can't keep you in a uh, wrestling class, then I don't think. <laughs> yep. If, if those yep. two can't get you coming back every day, man. I know, uh, I know Ron Hutchison. He was an advocate of, especially when you have one guy like, send Bodie in there and, and uh, learn how to sell uh, a head scissors. So you're, they're always clamping you on a head scissors and you have to learn <laughs> how to sell that 92 different ways. Yes, sir. Yes, With sir. Each one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I got some funny stories that I can embarrass those girls with where they, again, they were just, they were, they were more of the dudes than, than, than the dudes. I mean, you know, again, they had just bigger balls than, than everybody else. And, and Hutchinson did make it easy on us. I mean, and I'm, and I'm happy that he did it. I think something that maybe we're all guilty of now is turning the other cheek so much where you're just letting every Tom, Dick and Harry into the business. Yeah. And then they act like little, little soft, little, again, when, I think when, when you combo platter, uh, soft, uh, weak, dumb and, and, uh, and entitled, man, that's a combo platter for some shitty wrestling. Yeah. I mean, like, I, Damian Adams. I mean, I don't know if you know Damian Adams or not over on the, uh, the East coast, um, trains a lot of the, uh, women no, wrestlers, sir. but he, he basically has a, a list. Like he doesn't put it out there. He's a, he's a wrestling uh, club more than a wrestling school. So, you know, you've got to have some credentials right. to get in there. He doesn't just take everybody, you know, as you were saying right sure. there. And, um, and, and, and that's the that's the hard part about that's the reality of these days is, you know, uh, you know, whether somebody's got talent or whether somebody doesn't have talent, you know, all, all the money in their pockets are all the equal same color green. So if you want to keep the lights yeah. on in your gym and whatever, if they're crazy enough sure. to walk in, you're crazy enough to teach them. But the, and, and, you know, so that that keeps, you know, you know, we got to pay insurance and rent and electric and all that stuff. And. But I, I preferred how Hutchinson and those guys did it where, you know, they, you know, you want to train with them, you, you know, you put a big chunk down up front and if he broke you, well, there ain't no refunds. It's not like you're going to Kmart to learn wrestling, you know? So if he broke you and you're too weak to be in it, well, you know, he got your money or whatever coach got your money, you know, and I've, I've heard that from some of the OGs of guys like listening to Dr. D talking about how, hey, man, I put my money down and the guy beat me up until I was the only one that would keep on coming back, you know? So I, I think... You know, I don't know that we have to like destroy the new guys, but I don't think we got to hold them with kid gloves and make sure they're wearing floaties either. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I mean, that's how be- OVW was originally. It was a it was a pretty big chunk of, of down payment first. I remember going to Nick Densmore's class, Eugene's class, and and even at that time, I, I mean, I started late. Um, this was probably two thousand ish, two thousand maybe. Yep. And there was like six people that came in with me, and there was already probably forty in the class. Yep. And it was only on Saturdays. And yep. I think at that time, uh, maybe we put like 500 down or something like that. But I was the only one that came back the next Saturday. I mean, so, you know, there's 2,500 bucks for people that never came back after the first class. Well, guy or girl, Rip Rogers runs a red blooded class. I mean, you know, he's going to weed you out. You know, Ron Hutchinson is going to weed you out. All these guys, Dr. Tom, all these guys are going to weed you out. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't spend that much time with Jake the Snake if he thought I was useless. Like we got along great, but I mean, he wouldn't have took me under his wing if he thought I was useless as tits on a bull. So, you yeah. know, you got to earn your keep. And I, as you should, you know, in life, let alone wrestling, you know, do the work. Right. So you know, I'm not entitled. Start, I was kind of looking and I know the Internet's not always correct or whatever. Did you did you get started a little late? Were you in your late 20s when you started? I started just uh, just before 25 before 25 okay yeah 
What, what yes, were you which doing I guess that I mean point? by these days is is probably probably late in the game, but I think I think where I could kind of make up the difference is I was a martial artist since I was eight years old. So, you know, so I had you know footwork and I had stamina and I had you know uh, I don't know core strength. I had fighting skills, you know. So I think I think the biggest difference. And again, to use a Rip Rogers system, which I use a lot, is this ain't fake. It's fixed. So I mean, I was a bodyguard. I was a bouncer. I was a tournament fighter. Um, and, and, you know, fast forwarding, jumping all over the place. Like when I was at SmackDown, you know, I was there as, as a red blooded dude that cr- probably could have kicked the shit out of half of those guys. I just was so enamored because I love this stuff so much. And I was kind of buying what everybody was selling, not realizing not everybody's trying to give you good advice, whether they're in the locker room or whether they were the producers and there was or coaches or what have you. There was a lot of wonderful people there, but I think if I had kind of just I don't know, been not such a fan and not loved it so much, I might have been able to differentiate a lot earlier, you know, what was bullshit and what was good, you know. And then I think I think once I kind of wrapped my brain around that, then, you know, I think my work rate and everything kind of switched a whole lot. I was too busy maybe trying to play wrestler for a long time, even though I could shoot, you know, hang. And I'm not Chuck Norris by any means, but but I'm afraid of no man or beast. I never have. And, and, uh, and I realized, well, that's not what this is. But in the locker room, you know, you had to kind of, you know, swim in shark infested waters. And Rip was one of the first guys to kind of help smart me up to that, you know, not just re- realizing, hey, good work will be rewarded. It's like, well, you, you know, that's that's for your stuff. Like paying dues is for you. Paying dues isn't to impress somebody else. Paying dues is for you to get where you got to get for you to be happy with yourself and sleep at night. You know, all right, I did my best. I tried hard. I succeeded. I didn't succeed. But all that stuff is internal. You know, we didn't, we never punched a clock. He said, okay, Damian Sandow paid 23 dues. Kofi Kingston right. paid 25 dues. Sin Bodhi paid 13 dues. doesn't work like that. Those, those dues are for us. You know, like Rip would say, Hey man, you know, you want to work on your body, you know, watch what you're putting in your body and, you know, lift a weight, do all that stuff. Like, you know, if you don't, people will see it. And then the first person that should see it, if you have any kind of common sense would be yourself. So there you go. It, this is sort of funny, but when, when I go down to class at OVW, that was like a two hour and 40 minute ride one way. Right. Then I would have class and I'd drive back 240 miles one way. Not 240 miles, two hours and 40. Oh yeah. Two hours and 40 minutes. Excuse me. And then I would go to another job at UPS because I had to have insurance. I don't know how many uh, people would appreciate how hard that, that is, you know? And in the meantime, I'm still training. And in the meantime, I had to be there an hour early <laughs> to let people sure. in. Sure. Well, and, what's, that, what's that old saying is you never got any heat from being early, right? Right. <laughs> but the thing about it is I expected everybody to have a work ethic for the rest yes, of the business. In the rest, yes, of the, the rest of the world, I don't give a shit. Yes, sir. You know? But yes, I expected you to eat right. I expected you to train on your fucking body yes, because sir. you could be the world's greatest worker. But if you're skinny fat or you're fat, it's going to be harder for you sure. because this is a this is a cosmetic business and you're sure. only hurting yourself. And when you can discipline yourself and make yourself train every day, no matter fucking what. As an employer, as a, if I was an employer, I'm saying, God damn, I want this guy. Yes, sir. This son of a bitch is here early, staying fucking late. He looks fucking great. He watches what he puts in his mouth. He's got discipline. And that's all uh, That's all an employer can ask for. And if, you know, and when you're asking all these fucking when questions I- and you're actually doing what I actually fucking tell you, that's fucking perfect. But those people are few and far between. Yes, sir. Everybody's walking around with their yes, lats sir. out thinking they're oh. fucking over. But, uh. Anyway, I interrupted <laughs> yeah. you. You're on a fucking roll. Go ahead. No, You're no, going, no. On a roll. You're going, baby. No, no. I, I don't want to interrupt you. I'd rather I'd rather listen to you than you listen to me uh, any day of the week, for sure. Um, a lot of what I say is is oh, a lot of what I say is 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 you know from from your mouth to my ears and right back out again. So you know, I tell tell the guys all the time. Hey, when when I say hey, two in the ring. If you're not the first two in the ring. Uh, you know, you're back of the back of the bus, you know, like I tell them all coaches are, are not just doing stuff to, 
you know, to, to teach you mechanics or whatever. That's just one little part of it. But you, when you see who are the first guys in the ring, who are the first guys at ring crew, who are the last guys to leave, that tells you a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll take work ethic and I'll, I'll take, I'll take heart over talent any day of the week. Like we can, we can teach people just about every mechanical trick in the book. We can't teach them heart, you know? Well, you can, I, I don't think, did I ever teach you anything about wrestling? Oh yes. You always say that. Yeah. You taught stuff about wrestling. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Very little. He acts like you never did anything. You, I remember you, when you came to OVW, you came to OVW. First of all, I had, I had seen you, uh, whatever. I think TNA. Were you at TNA before yes, sir. that? Yes, sir. And I'd see, I'd seen you there. And of course, you know, you're, you're, you're playing your, your gimmick, which I'm not sure with you. Uh, the, the couple times I've met you, you probably have no idea, but I've met you a couple times. I was in class with you a couple times. No, I, re I recognize you. I, I don't know how far your gimmick is from your real life. You seem, uh, the times I met you, you seem pretty, let's call it quote unquote normal. Uh, compared I try. To what I try. You know, I try, I try to kayfabe my normalcy, but yeah. <laughs> Compared to what you see on TV, but I just remember you coming in class and you were kind of in gimmick in class and Rip had you in there and he had you do heat for a minute without like really doing any heat. Sure. It was all facials and visuals. Oh, and don't, don't, don't let, don't rep, don't let Rip fool you or work you. He taught us so much about wrestling, so much about psychology so much about life uh I'm pr maybe even more than he realizes i don't know because when you pay attention to these guys and they're dropping gems they can't help it or guys like rip or dropping little little turd gems every five seconds of knowledge and if you don't pick it up and eat that you're a fool you know and and, and uh something I, I remember rip had kind of joked with me one time and i've said this to a thousand the thing is psychology, the psychology applied to rest you know, he used a bit of different verbiage, but, you know, talking about that, like, entertain people, like, uh, make, make people believe, you know, to, between Jake and Doc and, and Rip and Al and these guys, like, you know, learning about credibility. You know, I don't do a million flips. I fly a camera and Rip and show me, you know, how to do this, how to do that, or, you know, learning different things. But, you know, my, my uh, you know, a high, high backdrop, because I know how to get up there and down flat. I know how to get clotheslined over my you know, backwards over the top ropes and land safely. I know how to hit the ropes on your lat so you don't come at it looking like a flying Walenda or somebody from Cirque du Soleil yeah. actually hitting the ropes like a fighter, even though I can't say any time I've ever ever needed to hit the ropes in a bar fight. But everything you do should credibly <laughs> make people go, oh, shit, this guy is legit. Yeah. And, and, and make it a career to having people believe me, even though I'm wearing bunny slippers and clown paint, and they still go, holy shit, this guy is legit. And that's that's all devil in the detail stuff. And that's all stuff learned from Rip Rogers, Dr. Tom, Jake the Snake, Dusty Rhodes, Al Snow, and so forth, Ron Hutchinson. You know, so I'm I'm good teachers. And I mean, again, I was I went to there. They just taught me how to, as Rip would say, it ain't fixed, it ain't fake, it's fixed. Just teach me how to work my stuff. Like just do what you would have done, just take care of the guy. Like two boxers in on the same gag, knowing they're going to split that winner's share of the purse, you know, a couple counties over once they got out of Dodge. Right. You know, nobody should know that it's a work. Like, I think the term work shoot is the dumbest, most redundant term ever. If it's a good work, it should look like a shoot. And that, that's just how I kind of see it. And again, yeah. I, that's that's just learning day after day, just listening to, to guys like Rip and so forth. Yeah, I can't remember that particular day. Somebody, two people were in before. And they ran out of like ran out of moves and and, and bumps to take in that minute, and it was just heat. It was, it was a minute of heat, and they had nothing else to do because they actually did slams and you know big big bumps, sure. all sorts and of then, stuff that they didn't sell. And then you had you got in there and did no bumps, and it was like I was saying, and it was just a hundred times better. And it, and Rip had showed us that before too. It was just amazing. I mean, just the difference. You would think those guys are killing each other. And it was, it, it, you couldn't buy it at all. And then you were I in get, there and it did nothing and it seemed real. I, I get this complimentary insult from a lot of workers after I wrestled them for the first time. And they kind of look around, make sure nobody's looking in the locker room. And they're like, man, I thought you were going to beat the shit out of me. And I didn't feel anything. Like, yeah. I mean, you were the lightest dude I've ever been in there with. And it, 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 everybody told me it looked disgusting and asked me, hey, if you're okay, did Sin Bodhi beat the crap out of you? I'm like, Sin Bodhi never fucking touched me. I'm like, it takes, you know, any monkey can slug another monkey. You know, it, it's, it's that lost art of making it look 
brutal and being gentle so we can, God forbid, work the next night and the next night and the next night and get home safely to our families. That's the illusion. Yeah. That's the work, the gag, the con, whatever you want to call it. Hey, man, I thought the same thing about you when we were in the uh, practice battle royal. I was like, oh, this guy's fucking great. I was I was kind of scared of you a little bit. And then it was. <laughs> well, good. That's the credibility, right? Like, as Jake the Snake would say, credibility is hard, harder, uh, hard earned and easily lost. So the moment the moment you tell everybody your stuff is horseshit, you're not getting that back, you know, so protect your protect your stuff. And a simple way to do it is just put a detail work on that. Let just know, hey, a real knuckle sandwich. That's a finish. You know, if you power bomb me in a bar fight, if I knock my head or something, OK, maybe I'm out. But if you pla if you literally get me flat on the concrete and my head hasn't hit, I'm scrambling up to beat the shit out of you. And the first guy to land that knuckle sandwich, that's the winner. Now, I might sell that power bomb on the on the bar floor a couple days later but right. in the middle of that fight when the dopamine and the adrenaline is going it's the first guy to land a knuckle sandwich so mm -hmm. i think a lot of these young guys and millennials and the gen z's and whatever the whatever the new things are <laughs> they just don't understand the value in a good knuckle sandwich like uh, that whole mike tyson thing everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face like i think <clears throat> a guy like rip rogers or dr tom or jake or myself or I don't I want to even put myself in their, their, their books, but I'm just saying as, as, a, as, a, as a guy that knows a thing or two about a thing or three, it's just you can look at somebody and go, yeah, a, a worker, and go, yeah, they've never been in a real fight, or yes, they have. Like, I, I could tell that literally before they lock up. I can see it how they walk through those ropes. I can see it how they move around that ring. I can watch their feet and their hips. And certainly by the time they lock up, I can tell you, yeah, they've been in a real fight or no. And, and that's not the, necessarily the fault of the modern-day uh, pussy because the modern day pussy has grown up in a modern day pussy landscape. So I'm glad that they didn't have to knock shoulders and then fist fight every time they, you know, you know, walked into a bar or something, but I, that's the era uh, and landscape that I grew up in. I would never choose to hurt a fly, but I grew up in that demolition man kind of era where again, you knock shoulders in a bar, you fought, then maybe you bought each other a beer afterwards. But I think those days are, you know, gone the way of the dodo bird. Nowadays it's such a soft, like oh, I'm triggered at this word. I don't know that I've ever been. I don't think the only thing that triggers me is the word triggered. So, you know, there everybody's you go. got a, got a little bit uh, toughening up to do, I think. So before you got into wrestling, then you, you'd mentioned a whole bunch of other stuff you, you were doing. So were you competing in like uh, martial arts and stuff like that? Or Yeah, when I was when I was younger, I get from, from like I was I was competing. I started martial arts. I started Kempo Karate and then. Um, my dad was like a, a Canadian champ, a U.S. champ, a European oh. champ in, in tournament fighting. So okay. I would get to train with this world champ for six months, that world champ or this Canadian champ or that American champ for a year or two years or six months or a year or two years and did all sorts of different styles of, of martial arts. Then on top of that, I was a bouncer. I was a bodyguard. Um, so just bringing that, that real life stuff, I, I didn't bring a lot of that into pro wrestling for the longest time because I was just sort of looking at it more of you know, costumes and superheroes and supervillains. And, and until I was really with, so I got my first really taste of that with TNA a little bit with maybe like Shane Douglas, and Wolfie D, give me some tips. Um, Jerry Lynn, guys like that, Kid Cash. And then I uh, got my second dose of it with, with Rip and Al and, and uh, Robert Gibson and, and, and Danny Davis and those guys. And they really smartened me up more than anybody had so far. And then Jake was always there kind of whispering in my ear. And, and a lot of a lot of what Jake said didn't make sense to me until what Rip and Doc and, and so forth said to me. Like, it's that whole, you know, parents talking to the kids. You'll get it when you're older. You'll understand when you, you got to eat these veggies now, even though you hate them or you don't understand why. You'll understand when you're older kind of a thing. And so a lot of the stuff that Hutchinson or Rip would say to me, you know, some some I would understand. And they, I mean, I remember Al Snow yelling at us one night. He was all you motherfuckers. I can work better than you all as you all because I understand you all better than you understand yourselves. So to me, that was a bunch of double talk. I don't know what the fuck that meant until I kind of spent a little bit more time with Jake and Jake, you know, said, you know, you're going to be an astronaut. You got to think about what it's like to going to be a vampire. It's going to be, you know, you got to understand about selling for the garlic and biting some fucking necks. If you're going to be a, mo uh, a monkey or a banana, you better be doing some slipping and sliding on that banana peel and flinging poop and humping ring posts and going to be a lawyer talk about subpoenas and hit people with a briefcase not all those characters need to hit the same super kick the same spine buster the same small package the same whatever so if you are unique and you're an individual character you know your own your own original material and again prefaced by by uh you know reference of stuff that came before you but 
don't be a Shawn Michaels ripoff. Don't be a Road Warrior ripoff. Don't be a Big Papa Pump ripoff. Take little itty bitty bits of history and morph it, turn it into your own original act. That way you're not a, you know, you're not a knockoff cover band. You're an original act right. and, and take real life things. Like I would joke all the time. Like I, I'm a big Star Wars mark. My favorite match, my favorite wrestling match of all time is Luke versus Darth. It's intergalactic Ricky Morton versus intergalactic Undertaker. The baby face is fighting upstream from the bootstraps all the way across the galaxy, only to get to the main event with a fresh top heel who's blowing up planets for shits and giggles. Well, fuck, if that's not an underdog story that I don't know what is, you know, Luke's got to, you know, he gets his family job in the first scene. Then he's got to find a coach and he's got to fight space monsters and stormtroopers and, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, spaceship fights with lasers and stuff only to get to the main event when Darth is just sitting already. He's not even warmed up yet. He's just, you know, uh, that's a story. And, you know, as much moves as Doc or, 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 or Al or, or Danny or Rip or Robert or anybody showed us, they more importantly, they showed us how to tell a story with those moves, how to make those moves important. If you just run spots all days and then you're both fresh enough to run around, uh, that, ain't, that ain't love and war. That's, that's ping pong. I don't want to just go, oh, oh, this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy. Oh, they're both fresh enough. Well, if the baby face is still fresh at the end of the match, we don't need any sympathy for him. And we don't have to hate the bad guy because he didn't do anything to the good guy. So as Rip used this magic word about eight minutes and 23 seconds ago, he said, sell. I, God forbid, challenge everybody, get a heel or baby face, you fucking sell. Yeah. And that doesn't just mean going, ow. It means putting over what's in front of you, understanding the moment and going, am I annoyed? Am I fresh? Am I dog tired? Am I beat up? Am I next to, am I got one foot in the grave? Am I, am I uh, proud? Am I this? Am I that? You know, understand how to put over whatever's in front of you. It's just, uh, we could talk, I mean, we could talk about this for a, a thousand years, but I mean, I hope, I hope people, uh, I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let Rip talk because I, I, I don't want to hear me. I, I'd way rather hear No, Rip. this is your interview. No, man. this is your interview. They're, hey. they're tired of hearing my old ass. What I did hear <laughs> from Christ. that though, Rip, was he, he if, did say something if, about you shouldn't have been a uh, Jimmy Valiant knockoff, I think is what he was, was getting at. I didn't imitate Jimmy Valiant. <laughs> I, sp speaking of Jimmy Valiant, I, I'm a big mark for Jimmy Valiant. I, I, all the all these cats that kind of paved the way for the the next generation and the generation after that generation. Um, I'll tell you, uh, uh, this is this is something I love telling uh, the uh, new guys or guys in a seminar. I'm literally on my way to to teach a seminar. I'm in my in a car with a, a pal of mine. There's my bro. He's getting me to uh, his show. We're gonna do a seminar soon. Um, but one of the one of the greatest things I ever learned in calling. Like, and that's a whole other, that's a whole other layer to, you know, uh, the, 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 whatever the leagues under the sea from under the, you see those waves crashing. That's what the fans see, but they don't see all the depths of that water that's underneath, you know, what the performers are doing. And uh, just the art of calling. Like when I call, I'm not calling clothesline, drop kick, body slam. I'm saying, Hey man, uh, sell Check your, uh, check your teeth, shake your knuckles. Uh, I, I might not tell them, take this punch. I'll just punch them and tell them sell to the second rope. Sell to the bottom rope, sell to the come along, sell to the apron, sell to a knee, grab my waist, grab my, uh, you know, grab my leg, uh, shake your head, you know, all that stuff. And so when I, uh, I got to wrestle Jimmy Valiant, I, my brain was blown wide open. I see him in a battle royal. We're in Memphis Coliseum. I'm in a battle royal with Jerry Lawler, Bill Dundee, Rock and Roll Express, nice. Kamala, Coco Beware, uh, Viscera, list goes on and on and on. And I'm marking out just being under those same lights that Andy Kaufman and, and Jerry Lawler and all these guys were. So I see Jimmy Valiant across the ring and I'm like, I got to get that motherfucker. He's getting up there. I don't know when my chance is ever going to be again. So I'm going to get him just to say that I got to work with Jimmy Valiant. So I sneak up on him and I give him the gentlest, most vicious, gentlest back rake in the, in the galaxy. And he turns around selling it and he's wobbling and selling. He's, and, and, and I have to fill up the time because I can't just stand there like a dope. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and I, so I can just stand there. I got to be looking all scary and whatever. And his cell, he just goes, oh, yeah, baby, darling. Thank you so much for taking care of me, baby. <laughs> and he goes, young man, can you throw a safe working punch, daddy? <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I can. And this is all while he's selling and I'm being all crazy. I go, yes, sir, I can. He goes, all right, baby, bring it on, daddy. <laughs> so I punch him in the mouth. So I took good like... care of him. He does another big, awesome sell where he's flinging his hands around and punching the air and selling and wobbling on those rubber legs. 
Thank you again, young man, for yet keeping me safe still, baby darling. Okay, young man, incoming, one of my own. And he winds up and gives me this big old punch, and I sell it, sell it as best as I could possibly sell it. And he knew I was marking out, so he, I sell it, and he goes, very nice selling, young man. And he, I think he had to go get with Lawler. He had to go do something with Lawler or something in the, in the Battle Royal. So it was very good selling, young man. Now, go about your fucking business. <laughs> <laughs> God, that man, is that's fucking awesome. awesome. I love and, I mean, that. Man. That whole conversation took place between a back rake and, and, and two punches. Oh, yeah. Have, have and so you can talk. Yeah. So, boys and girls listening, realize you don't just have to go a uh, clothesline, a uh, body drop. Bad, 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 body drop. Uh, yeah, you can just have a conversation. Like, I lock up with guys all the time and I feel how tight they are. And I literally, like, I owe you money, motherfucker. You know, they you know who else would do that? I, Nick Dinsmore was like that with me when I first yeah. was getting started and I was doing the yeah. amateur stuff with him. Yeah. He would walk you through every – he would tell you things you couldn't even imagine. Yeah. Just exactly I, what you're saying. Nick would I do that. I think Rip Rogers – I think Rip had said to me, do I owe you money, motherfucker? And truth be told, I think I do. I think I owe Rip still a few bucks, so I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll incriminate myself online and say, Rip, I, I promise I will – I will take care of you one of these days when I when I grow up and I and I have a few bucks in my pocket. I promise you, uh, it's documented now on the internet. I owe you money. I will I will pay you money if it's the last thing I do. Yeah. Uh, but no, Dick would tell me every little step, every little thing to do, and I I just couldn't I couldn't believe it. He was so clear, so concise, so precise, just everything. I I just. I was well, that's, it. Can, uh, if I if I learned anything from my practice wife, it is communication is key. So <laughs> talk to your dance partner. Hey, you know, make sure that. they know my clothesline, your clothesline. You know, a lot of people, a lot of these guys these days, they don't know correct uh, vernacular. They don't know correct jargon. My, hey, your, watch my take, give. Watch, they don't know that. What yeah. does watch the elbow mean? It means I'm taking an elbow in the mush. Or does that mean look out and duck it? <laughs> I, oh, I've had, I, oh, every mistake I've made, and now I have to make sure I idiot proof everything. Hundred percent, hundred percent. The guy said, "He said let's work strong, strong style." I said, "Strong style? That's a hell of a fucking rib." They said, "What do you mean?" Well, you knock the shit out of the guy and he don't sell it. Instead, I want to do phony wrestling where it looks like I knocked the shit out of it, and you can fucking sell, and everybody gets into it. But if you 100%. want, but if you want me to hit you hard and don't sell it, I can have some real good fun with that. I can knock the fuck out of it. Hundred percent. Oh, hundred percent. One night I was one night 100%. I was working with Jimmy Valiant. Jimmy said, Marcus, tonight, brother, no violence, baby. I no was, violence. That was the hell, So I said, oh, I got you. Got you, JV. He walked out. As soon as he walked out, I hit him over the head with a go goddamn garbage can. He just started flopping right there. Right there. Had him got the red. Bubba just start fucking flip-flopping right there. He goes, yes, you sir. motherfucker. <laughs> he just kept on a flopping. Kept on a fucking flopping. Jesus Christ. But whatever he did, whatever he did was brilliant. I mean, it was just, you oh, just yeah. could watch him. And, and you know, again, with, with the wrestling kids, I tell them, you don't have to run spots to be interesting. You have to be interesting to be interesting. And Jimmy was yeah. sir interesting. Oh, uh, he was awesome. Man. I remember. Yeah, big time. I, I big time. I'd, I'd get in the fucking ring when Heenan would be working for W. He, Heenan would be uh, working color. And I do the handsome Jimmy imitation. Looking up at the fucking sky, doing Jimmy about 1971 or two. Heenan would just start fucking laughing on fucking TV. It was so goddamn fucking funny. <laughs> I'm, I'm in that weird unicorn age where I be around a lot of the you know, the 80s guys, but I'm still young enough where I can have new guys. So that sort of a, a, a school to old, you know, like I was joking, I think you know, man, a water, a, a alley, you know, like water can smash rock or whittle, whittle, whittle through the, the cracks. Water is versatile, you know, so learning so many tricks from the 80s guys and then parlaying that into the, uh, you know, trying to deal with all the young guys. And, you know, guys like Bobby Heenan, I got to spend time around, whereas opposed to these young guys, they maybe would only have seen a Bobby Heenan on a YouTube clip or something where I organically got to be in the ring with, you know, all these, a lot of these different dudes and I just reap the benefits of keeping my eyes and ears open and just absorbing knowledge, you know, like, I mean, they had tricks for days, Bobby Heenan had tricks for days and listening to, if you would, if you wouldn't listen to Bobby Heenan, you'd be a fool. Yeah. So when you went to OVW, you were under contract yet, right? Didn't you just go to OVW? No, I got hired out of OVW. I got, uh, before I went to OVW, I was, I was kind of 
toying with the idea of either moving over to England full time where I could, where I could wrestle just about every day or trying to get to OBW where maybe I could, you know, get an opportunity with, with WWE. And, uh, it was Al Snow that, that, uh, brought me into OBW. I'd wrestled him a few times on indie shows and he, he thought I was interesting and fun and uh, unique. And he thought I was a nice enough guy. Uh, he thought, man, if you come down here, he goes, you know, you're, you're young enough where I got a shit ton. I can teach you and Rip Rogers and Danny Davis can teach you. But at the same time, you're, you're already useful enough where I could put you with another guy. And that, that's one less guy for me to have to babysit. And he goes, all those tapes go to Vince. So maybe you'll get a job. And I'd like to think you will soon. And I, I want to say I got hired about six or seven months into being at OVW. So oh, was really? thank, yeah. So thank you, Al Snow. And again, thank you for for putting up with me, Rip Rogers and, and Robert Gibson and Danny Davis. I, I remember the day that I got hired, I walked in, I was the last one to know. And all these fuckers knew about it. I walked that. in and I walked in and I looked at Robert Gibson. He looked like a fucking six year old kid with his hand in a cookie jar. He just looked so suspicious. And I'm like, I'm like, Hey, Hey hoot, what's going on? He's, Nothing. And he walked away and uh -huh. looked at Danny Davis and Danny Davis just, I swear to God, Danny Davis pulled that Beavis and butthead shit. He just looked at me and, just, and walked away. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Al Snow just looked at me and just like, uh, hey, kid. And then he walked away, kind of giggled and walked away. I'm like, well, what the fuck is going on? And then I, I want to say uh, Danny was like, oh, yeah, by the way, you got a call. There's a, a phone phone waiting for you in the office. And, and I walked into the office and it was Mike Bucci. He was Nova. And, and then he, uh, he, sprung, he sprung it on me. And I walked out. And then Danny and all these guys are all kind of giggling. And I, think, I, me I, just, I, remember looking, I remember looking at Rip Rogers' face later that night. And he just had this fun. He twinkle in his eye, I just kind of, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, and he gave me a hug and he walked in and he goes, now fuck off, go get in the ring and, <laughs> and he gave me a hug, I told had me a hard to fuck time off putting and, it over, and uh, then it was it was, yeah, and then it was it was business as usual. There you go, we got in and we we, we got our asses fucking uh, beat, you know. What's what's funny is there's nothing better when you're a teacher or you're some kind of coach or whatever, and one of your boys gets signed, called up to anything, you're yes, just sir. as proud as a fucking peacock. And yes, if sir. you don't want any, you, they don't have to say your name, fuck all, you know that you helped them get there and you're prouder than fuck. Yes, you're sir. You're helping these guys. Cause everybody that went to OBW, everybody I've been at, they've all had different special stories of how in the hell they got there, how in the hell they got a job, the shit they went through to get there, and it all worked out because they had enough guts and balls to leave wherever they were from, probably didn't have a pot to fucking piss in, got to OVW, and somehow they got a motherfucking job. And you're sitting yes, there, God damn, this is so fucking satisfying to help these guys because when you're teaching them, you're teaching them the style that I believe in. I can't teach new shit. I don't know no new, don't want to know, no. I just know that if you do it right, if it's old school, people are still the same. Yes, sir. And if you, do old, fashion, if you do old fashioned shit, people today... It's a new audience, and they haven't seen this old-fashioned shit. 100%. Years ago, with the territories, everybody was so good, it was sort of the same. Unless you were complete Dick the Bruiser, Mad Dog Bashan, or whatever you were fucking doing. But now, you go out and work slow, you tell a story, you're in total fucking character. You don't have to fucking really do anything, but you steal the show, because everybody else has to get all their dive and all their shit in. But you, yes, sir. Hundred percent. Oh, we got to have ninety-two false finishes, all on two point nine for no fucking reason. But I'll get 100%. off. Hundred percent. I want to hear you talk some more. I like that. <laughs> no, no. I, I everything, everything, boys and girls, everything that Rip Rogers said, I agree with one billion percent. And, and you know, talking about coaching versus performing, I think you know it, there it's both rewarding and you know and you know when you're on a show performing. It's uh, you get that that rush that you're entertaining fans and putting smiles on faces, and it, it's kind of more like watching an action movie where you're seeing all the stuff getting blown up and everything is fun and, it, and you're having like a like a kind of a, a crazy fun time. 
And then when you're coaching and one of your kids gets called up, it's almost like watching like a sleepless in Seattle or something, some romance movie where you just, you feel it in your heartstrings, you know? So one, one you kind of have the adrenaline and then the other one, it just kicks you right in the heart. So like, you know, seeing like some of my kids that are just, that are up now or, you know, Chris Bay or, or Zoe Stark on NXT, like I'm proud to say that's my kid, you know, or Carrie and cross and just, just a ton of others. And Jacob Fatu, all these, uh, you know, uh, uh, Sefa, uh, solo, uh, solo Sokoa, all these guys like help break these guys in, help train these guys, you know? And I'm just like, when I see them and I watch them move in the ring and I see the, the difference that, the, that what they're doing versus some of the other guys and girls that are maybe a little too busy sports entertaining. And I, I'm watching yeah. the devil in the details fly and just watching how organic they are because that's how I was taught. And that's what I taught them, man, there ain't a better feeling than that. Oh my goodness. It's, it's proud Papa one-on-one, you know, had you ever met rip before you got to OVW? Nope. So well, I mean, your... I knew exactly who he was. I watched. You did know. I watched tape on him. Of course, I knew who he was. Some people I was don't. Too. <laughs> I, I giggle when I when somebody comes into into the school. I mean, I'm just a, I'm just a guy that play fights in spandex, you know. But when you come into the school, you you probably might want to know who the coaches are. Yeah. You know, so some people, of course, they do. They did their homework, and then I get other people coming, and, and you are sir. And I always tell them if they don't know who I am and they're coming into my school, I usually tell them I'm Coco Beware or Tugboat. <laughs> Like tugboat, nice to meet you. Cool. And then they go, Oh, nice to meet you, tugboat, sir. And then so however cool. long it takes somebody to smarten them up, then whatever. But I hundred percent knew who Rip Rogers was. Watch, what was watching your first that. impression on him when you met him? Oh fuck, I loved him right away. I just if I if, if he wouldn't have punched me in the mouth, I'd have fucking hugged him every five seconds. But it, you know, you know, he's always busy yelling at us, and it was it was funny that you know he, I would call it like yelling out of love, like he he wanted to show us and did show us the right way. And he wasn't going to make it easy because that's not how it could be. Like we're not robots. We just stick a thumb drive in our ear and, you know, plug the, the proper programming in humans need to learn the way humans need to learn. And I guess the best way I could sum up rip is that old adage of uh, hard times makes good people. Good people make good times, good times makes weak people. And here we are. So, you know, rip taught us the hard way. So we would be good. You know, if you if you handheld these motherfuckers, then they're just going to be these weak little sniveling entitled fox. But Rip put it to us, so you know the strong the strong will survive, and the other ones can go be baristas and uh, accountants and whatever else, whatever honest jobs help spin the world. You know, Hosting, but I mean, uh, Rip Rip podcast. made sure that we were solid enough and and strong enough mentally and physically to to put smiles on people's faces. You know, that's a that's a privilege when you think about it. You know. I am too weak to ask you on a daily basis if you want fries with that. I would go fucking postal in a week, but I could sleep in cars and travel the world and starve and pay my dues to wrestle, you know, because that's where my passion was. But to entertain and put the smile on the face of the guy that's asking if you want fries with that, to me, that's the ultimate badge of honor. Like when, when everybody was squawking and bitching and moaning that uh, WWE was a thing, uh, 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 was deemed essential when we were in the lockdowns and the pandemic and everybody's going, why is the wrestling essential? Well, motherfuckers, uh, people are social creatures. And when you're stuck like rats in a cage, because the government tells you you're not allowed to leave your house. And these athletes who are prime physical specimens have the balls to still entertain people. You need, you need uh, uh, that stuff to keep sane. We're not just, you know, little hamsters sitting there, we have to be engaged, you know, and like I had so many people on that snake pit rip. I swear to God, my, my biggest compliment in all of pro wrestling ever was I'll get to a show. Like I'm driving to the show right now and I'll get to a show and I'll meet young wrestlers that I never met before. And they'll say, man, thank you, coach. That snake pit kept me fucking from going bonkers during the pandemic. So yeah, well, hopefully between, you know, all the coaches dropping knowledge that is useful. But I think just the, the the distraction from the real life being rats in cages was so important. And I'll, dude, I would take that over any fucking piece of tin, you you know, in any day of the week. You know, uh, that to me is, and again, like even before I ever took a step foot into a wrestling ring, you know, having my senseis teaching me like the right way. Like, like I, I like watching UFC once in a while, just fine. I don't follow it. Because to me, sometimes it's a bit of a human cockfight. It's just two guys going out to beat the shit out of each other. And I was taught way more, you know, kind of like karate kid style, Miyagi-Do style. I was always taught, use it to solve a problem, not to start a problem. And so 
I kind of think about that when I think about pro wrestling. I'm teaching these kids stuff to not just how to do the correct suplex or how to feed the right way or to use the right jargon, but I'm teaching them how to navigate, you know, life so they can go travel the world and they can go see the stuff that I've seen, man. I, I've, I've seen the Statue of Liberty. I've seen oceans and deserts and mountains, and I've ridden horses on tropical, tropical waterscapes. I've seen Stonehenge. I've ridden motorcycles through deserts. I've gotten over in every strip club mentioned in every Motley Crue song ever. You know, I've, I've lived a, a thousand lives. You know, I might not have gotten to do any of that stuff if it That's wasn't. That's the best right there. The, hey, brother, you know, each to their own. But, you know, I'm happily married now. But, you know, when you're young and, and you travel in the world, and I still travel the world, and it's my, it's the, the best part about pro wrestling, entertaining fans in Puerto Rico, entertaining fans in Mexico City, entertaining fans in in. Uh, in Liverpool or London, entertaining fans in Toronto or Louisville or Memphis or, you know, wherever, wherever the heck you're going, you get to see the world. Yeah. You know, I've seen, I've seen Aztec temples. I've seen just uh, so many things that I wouldn't have seen if I was asking if you want fries with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Great. ultimate, ultimate reward. Did Rip ever uh, do the ding, get the fuck out of the ring with you? Did you ever get kicked out of the ring? We the, the promo the promo thing is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. Like in the middle of like a uh, whether oh, it be when a he just drill gonged you, like when he gonged you, like the gong show of uh, anything. Where he, he rings the bell. Fucking rotten. Get out. He, yeah, that's fucking rotten. Get out. Yeah. I, I want to say I I have never been dinged by by Rip Rogers. Oh. I, I'll 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 take that as a I'll toot my own horn right there. Never been dinged by the hustler. Man. Um, but what, what he used to do all the time, and I, I would, it would really, uh, it would flatter me to no end that I was amusing Rip Rogers. We would do the, the promo class and he would ring the bell every time he wanted us to switch into a different character. I yeah. literally was just doing that with my kids yesterday night in the class or two nights ago in my class. And I just say, look, start out, cut, start cutting a promo on whoever you want about whatever you want. Do it as yourself. When I ding you, be somebody else. When I ding you, be somebody else. Think of it like a Sybil drill. Like you're just give me a different personality and, and Rip would ding people, you know, maybe once or twice, three times if they're lucky. And I swear Rip would ding, ding me like 10, 15, 20 times and just giggle the whole time. Cause I would just go from a French guy to a hillbilly, to an astronaut, to a Russian guy, to a whatever. And he would just go, okay, Cinny. All right. All right. I'm done. Thank you. Get the fuck out. <laughs> I remember you came back from, I think it was some sort of WWE tryout somewhere. It wasn't through, it wasn't, physically at OBW. Maybe you were up on the road. I can't remember, but you had come back to class and you said that they, they um, took a bunch of guys in for like promos. And, and I think they gave you something to talk about. I think I can't remember or else it was just on the fly and didn't give you notice, but you said most of the guys in there were totally lost, had no idea what to do, no idea what to talk about. And you said you nailed it yep. right on the right on cue 60 seconds, whatever it was. Oh, so, and, and the body clock is another thing. Rip taught us about using that mental body clock, whether it's a promo or a match, because you go 30 seconds over, let alone two minutes over. You go two minutes over on SmackDown or Raw, you're fired, you know, because you just cost Vince a million dollars in ad revenue, you know? So if you go home 30 seconds early, the, you know, the commentators can talk about what happened, what's up next, and then they can throw it over and you get some, and visually while they're talking, they're, they're looking at you celebrating or selling or whatever. But if you go one, two, three to commercial, they're not getting any of that kind of happily ever after stuff. But as far as the promo stuff, what I, I think what I was talking about was a couple of years later at FCW coming back. And so I would be in Dusty Rhodes' promo class and I just cut my promos off the fly. Rip always taught us, just go off the fly, talk about this guy, okay, go. And then take it home when you need to take it home. And then same, Jake, Jake the Snake would always be like, you know, Work as long as you need to work. When you got to take it home, take it home. If you have all this shit planned, how can you edit when you you plan a 12-minute match and they tell you to go home in six or three? You can't stuff 12 minutes into three minutes. That's, you know, ask Einstein. That, 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 that's physically impossible, you know? So just know how to work. So you got to go home. We got 12 minutes. And then, but we got, you know, once we cross through the ropes and they tell us to take it home in, in two, motherfucker, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be back in, in a minute 25, you know? So the promos... Everybody, I'd see them and Dusty would see them all walking around, memorizing whatever they wrote the night before for promo class and talking about this and that. And they're catching all these funny little catchphrases that just sounded like, you know, some kind of cheap soap opera. So I would just make sure I sat right in front of Dusty the whole time. So he saw that I was never memorizing. I wasn't whatever. And, you know, everybody would pick these promos. I'm talking about Kane. I'm talking about Undertaker. I'm talking about, you know, this guy or that guy. 
I would just watch whoever was in front of me, whoever went before me, that's who I'd cut my promo on. So that way, Dusty knew I was 100% riffing off the fly. So if, if Jack Swagger was going, he, uh, like Jake Hager was going up in front of me or Kofi Kingston or whoever, or, you know, uh, TJ Wilson or whoever, I just cut a promo on them. And I just, same like in a match, I just take what's there. You know, if I, if I, got, if I got a chop on the brain, but the guy's feeding me his back, well, to try to turn around and lift his chin, do all this bullshit, too much work for not enough payoff. So I'll just, I'll give the guy a back rake. And if he ever feeds in a position for that chop, great. And if not, there's always the next match. But just whatever was happening, it just would unfold on organically. Same thing with a promo. I don't need to memorize the ways I'm going to beat the shit out of you. I'm just going to put you over as an opponent. So I'm not beating a bag of shit or losing to a bag of shit. You know, I'm talking about you like, man, you're the biggest cat I've ever seen. And you're as strong as a house, but I don't like the way you treat people. So when I get you in there, man, and I get you nice and close, and these tickle knives are going to fish hook you and you will be submitting like a little bitch. You know, like I, I make sure the guy sounded like a big brick shit house before I took him. But if I told him, hey, you're a piece of shit, you can't wrestle your way out of a wet paper bag. Well, if I beat him, you know, I, I beat a piece of shit. If I drew to him, then I'm equal to a piece of shit. And if I lost to him, I'm worse than a piece of shit. So guess what? I'm going to cut a promo off of how good this dude is, how deadly this dude is. And anything I talk about in the negative is going to be something that does not take away from how dangerous he is. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds like... I mean, it so sounds basic to me, but try to tell that to some of the young cats and it's oh, yeah. like talking yeah. to a fucking wall, but... Hey, we're going to wrap up here in a little bit, Rip. Rip, what do you got? What do you remember about Sin coming down to class in OVW? You got any, you got any memories? Hell, I can't remember where I was at last week. Are you kidding me? I was there so goddamn long. I had so many guys in there. I said, was you in there? I said, oh, no, that was like 10 years before. That was 10 years after. Whatever. He still won't put you over. All these years later, he still won't put no, you over. I mean, no, I, I treated everybody the same, like a piece of shit. You know, and uh, but then but then I wanted survival skills. I couldn't. I wasn't gonna have no pussies out there, because if you couldn't put up with me, when you got in the the business of pro wrestling in the big time, or everybody, nobody's really your friend because you're you might take their goddamn fucking job. Right. So you need to learn how to defend yourself, mentally, medically, or mentally, physically, and basically and pretty much emotionally because uh, the, the best, the better you are, the more everybody hates you. Everybody loves you until you start doing better than them. So I, I, I got a rip, I got a rip story for you right here. This will, and I don't know, rip, maybe you remember, maybe you won't remember. And it's perfectly fine if you don't, but I remember coming in with that bleach blonde hair and the crazy beard and the silly, you know, the braids. And I look like some kind of intergalactic pimp or something. I just looked like I was from outer space and rip was giggling and, I could never get that. I, I always had that weird eyeliner and stuff on, but I, I didn't have any makeup remover because I didn't know about that. I just would kind of wash it off as best I could. So I always showed up looking like a half dead hooker, you know, and Rip would always just kind of giggle looking at me like, what did you do last night? Were you out like, like, no, nah, I got a good night's sleep. I don't party. He goes, well, you look like you're a fucking hot mess. Like you look like, you know, some rock star on his deathbed or something. Cause I have the eyeliner just smeared on my face from the night before. And, and I was wearing this pink, this pink t-shirt that had a bunny, like a cartoon bunny rabbit getting strung up on a, on a noose and rip just looked at me one day and he go, and he just giggled. He looked, he goes, see if you can get that over in real life. And I, and I took it as a challenge. And so later that night, I, I want to say that after the class, I'm sorry, boys and girls, I'm just, I'm in transit. So I don't mean to be cutting out on you. Blame, put, put heat on the internet. Come on, Elon yeah. Musk. Come on, Zuckerberg, get your act together. Give me an internet that works. <laughs> um, so anyway, so at that time, it was two for two, a double whammy in the Bible belt because I looked kind of like a defensible kind of character. So Bob, uh, Bible thumpers didn't like me. And then, and then the good old boys weren't very high with bleach blonde hair and all that stuff. Kind of, again, very Rip Rogers-esque, you know, like had the beard and the blonde hair, very, very Rip Rogers-esque. And so I walk into this Waffle House. I walk into a Waffle House in a pink bunny t-shirt, blonde hair, eyeliner, and I mean mugged every fucking biker, farmer, trucker, in that fucking place. And I just looked at everybody like a shithead. And I just thought this as an experiment, you know, and I thought if anybody was to stand up and call me on it, I would have been, I would have apologized and said, Hey, I'm just fucking around. I'm a pro wrestler. I'm just being silly. Let me buy you a coffee and some eggs or something. But I swear every biker, farmer, trucker that looked at me just 
didn't know how to perceive it. And I was staring at them like there was no ifs, ands, or buts. I was looking at them for a fight. And they just all sunk in their chairs. And I kind of thought, God damn, Rip Rogers was right. If you own your shit and believe your shit, you can get over just about anything, you know? And so that was, and I, I came back the next day and he goes, I see you're alive. He goes, it must have worked. <laughs> I said, yeah, yes, sir. I go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, so I don't know if you remember any of that, Rip, and I don't blame you if you don't, but it's definitely a story. I, I teach the kids. I tell them I don't, I don't advocate going out and, and, and doing that, you know, because a lot of them probably couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. And, and I, maybe I would have got my ass kicked if some of those bikers actually stood up, but, and, and I would, I would have talked my way. I would have cut a promo backwards, a heel walking backwards. Hey, 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 I would have backed up and said, I'm just playing, just walking around, but I didn't have to. And, uh, it was a funny, funny, eye awakening, eye opening, awakening experience. So. Well, I don't that remember. Was a rip, rip, it, rip it, sounds, it sounds like something I would do. So what the hell, right? So you made it. <laughs> I don't remember, but it sounds like me. So I lived, I lived. So, so there you go. Oh God! Hey, so we have not talked really at all about the WWE. We don't. All right. We we don't really have to talk about the WWE if you don't want to. But uh, I, I'll talk about anything you want. What? Um, I don't even remember what year you ended up going up there. Was that like oh seven or eight? I, I got oh, hired. I got hired early oh uh, late oh six, early oh seven. Uh, I guess it, I guess it must have been this early going into the summer of 07 because I had to go back to Canada to get my like uh, work papers and stuff. And then uh, I got down there uh, just before 07 and I was there till around uh, late 09. Was that on the uh, SmackDown brand? Yep. Yes, sir. Who, who, who was kind of running that at that time? Was that? Uh, so a couple of the guys that were, that were the writers that I were dealing with was Freddie Prince Jr. He was real nice. Wow. Uh, John Carl, he's a good dude. I'm still, we're still buddies to this day. Um, a couple other guys. And then, uh, the producers, uh, my producers were, uh, were Arn, um, sometimes IRS and Dean Malenko, uh, a little bit of Steamboat. I think Steamboat just, Steamboat remembered me a lot from uh, FCW and we got along really well. Uh, got along great with Arn, and uh, I think something that, that kind of shook Arn's head about me was, you know, I, I never understood this about some of the boys. I'm not going to bury anybody and say names, but like when we would get out of the cars, all the fans would be behind those chain link fence, just just itching to get a, a wave or a picture or an autograph or something. And some of those fucking prima donnas, they wouldn't even look at the boys. I mean, look at the fans. They would just walk in like they were just too cool for school. I never got that at all. I would stop. I would sit there for a fucking hour. I would sit there as long as it took for Arn Anderson or Dean Malenko to come walk outside and go, hey, you fuck, get inside. We got shit to do. But I would stay out there and take photos and, and uh, talk to people because I thought, if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be here, you know? And um, But Arn was real cool about it. He just giggled. He goes, if I know, if I need to find where Kazarni is, I'll just go outside and go see him with the fans and stuff. And, and uh so I just I was always fan interactive. I'm still fan interactive. I was fan interactive on SmackDown, even when they kind of told me not to. I was always fan interactive on. I did a, I did a bunch of ton and ton of live events where I kind of was like, I mean, what do you mean don't sell to the crowd? What the fuck does that mean? You know? And and the producer sometimes the producers just be like, well, this is kind of what's coming down the pipe. So as Rip would say, you know, we'll teach you the right way, and then when you get there, just do whatever dumb thing they want you to fucking do. Yeah. Yeah. And and so I mean, I swear, Arn and those guys. Is they, they said it in much more diplomatic terms, but they'd be like, well, you know, <laughs> you know, whoever's signing those checks. So just uh, focus on you. And I certainly would. But I always, always kind of kept the audience like, into it. And I think that was also something that Dusty would, always, like, you know, Gibson and just like make them a part of the show. Like Robert would always talk about uh, Ricky looking like he's trying to tag out to the audience, let alone tagging out to Robert. Make all those kids in the front row, all those women in the front row looking like they're trying to help them out. Like they could, they could possibly help Ricky Morton, you know, instead of just memorizing and running a bunch of dumb spots. Like I would look at the crowd. I'd work with the crowd. If somebody was looking at me, I'd give them a little wink or I'd stick my tongue at them or do whatever it was I was doing, but I would be very interactive. And to this day, I'm interactive. I, I pick my, I pick my, uh, my crowd very carefully because as you know, sometimes the crowd will do something stupid. So I've always got my head on a swivel and, and again, I think, uh, knock on wood, I've got my ass kicked tonight at the show, but I've never mean mugged a fan where they didn't just kind of melt and go, I don't know. Yeah, he's playing. Yeah, he's wearing, you know, bunny slippers and clown paint. But I kind of think this guy might be able to fucking bite my face off. So maybe I won't fuck with him. 
you know, so, so all that kind of stuff was just what they wanted to avoid. So they just didn't want any of the, their talent going near the guardrails, but I did it all the time. Cause I just, it was a fun way to get the crowd right into stuff, you know, and as, as Kazarni doing a ton of those live events, I was like the only new indie guy on the time. And then and like, I wasn't some guy that just got hired and just got given a job. Like I was paying my dues for a long time. And still to this day, I pay my dues, but I was literally in the middle of the card. I wasn't the opening guy. I was stuck somewhere in the middle of the card. Little old me that nobody had ever heard of. I'm in, I'm in a card with the Hardy boy. And are there, are we there? I just saw it drop out of it. Or can you guys hear me? No, yep. No, 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 we can. We're there. And yeah. so I'm in, I'm in the middle of a card with all these guys. And then I'm either wrestling MVP or Chavo Guerrero or, or, uh, you know, uh, whoever. And so I had to earn these people every night. And again, thank you, Rip Rogers. He was like sitting on my shoulder, like a little, little cartoon Rip Rogers sitting on my shoulder going, they don't know you make them know you, you know, like I can't expect them to see those vignettes, those Kazarni vignettes or whatever, you know, make them, make them love you, make them hate you, you know, earn it. And to this day, I'll walk into a show with a hundred people, with a thousand people. I've wrestled all the way up to a hundred thousand people. And I don't expect anybody to know who I am. I will tell that story curtain to curtain. I will let you exactly what I am. And I will let you know very quickly because the sooner you know, the sooner you know who to cheer for and who to boo for and who to invest in and all that. So that was definitely something that, that rip had, had, had planted in my brain. That really helped me out there. So knowing, okay, I'm on a show with Undertaker and Big Show and Hardy Boys and a Triple H and all these guys. But when I get in there, that's half my ring. And whoever's standing across from me, they're going to better, they better earn their half or I'm going to take their half too. And everybody in that audience knew that, you know, I, I was in there to, to win. I was in there to beat the shit out of my dance partner in a working fashion. And that was it. That was it. Yeah. So how did that, um, how did the WWE run then? How'd that come to, to an end? Was that uh, politics? Politics yeah. is all it was. I mean, I got, I got good reviews from all my agents, all my producers. I was, I, Cause I tell you right now, I never walked in, even when I had a shitty day, I never walked in there with anything less than a smile on my face. How are you today? Excellent, sir. How are you, sir? You know, I was always positive. You know, I learned a little bit of that from Rip and I learned a little bit of that. I learned a lot of that from, from my, my senseis growing up. You walk in there as a kid or a teeny bopper and you have the boo-boo face on. They say, we don't ever want to see that boo-boo face, you know? And I, I remember, I literally remember Rip Rogers saying in this again, uh, some other coaches have said it with, maybe a, a slight, slightly less tact, uh, but Rip, Rip said it the way I needed to hear it. He goes, I don't give a fuck if your family gets murdered in the morning. If you're getting in the ring that night, you are to think about you and your, your dance partner's safety and nothing else. He goes, you know, you can, you can toil before the ring and after the ring about, you know, losing your job or losing your wife or losing your, you know, your, your family got sucked up into a fucking tornado and they're gone. Well, if you, if you get in the ring that night, you better be focused on, on safety and, and entertaining those people. Cause those people, they're going through the same shit as you are and they need to, they need a release. They need to pay their hard earned money so they can boo and cheer and let it all out. And if you don't deliver anything less than that, then you're a piece of shit. And so that was definitely uh, again, I'm paraphrasing, but Rip, I think Rip <laughs> said it harsher. Rip said it to me harsher than that, but you get the point because it, it, it knocked it home to me. I was like, yes, sir. So every time I was at SmackDown, you know, I was going through a pretty bad breakup I never let anybody, nobody was smart enough to that. You yeah. know, I was always, yes, sir. No, sir. Thank you, sir. I was always the first one in the ring. Always the last one to leave. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to rep uh, OBW wrong. I wasn't going to let uh, rip or doc or Al or Robert or Danny. I wasn't going to let any of those fuckers down. So when I, I, when I got canned, what's that? No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish up. Go ahead. When I got canned, it had nothing to do with lack of work rate. It had nothing to do with lack of effort. It just, just straight out politics and, and, and however the fuck that wind blows. It was never for me doing anything, you know, dirty or, or not delivering or whatever. It was just, I want to say, and somebody sucked up more than I did. So they got the, they kept the gig and I didn't, I don't know. You know, it was just, it was a budgeting and politics it had nothing to do with, with me not being able to deliver. I actually had a bunch of people saying, holy fuck, I don't know why that happened, because you're a pretty darn good worker. So, so, 
pro wrestling is. Yes, what I was going like, to say. I, I mean, on, on a personal note, I, I've always loved your shit, man. I've always loved watching oh, you. Oh, thank you. I, I, it's just one of those things. Like you, you were different. You stood out. Um, you're very like intriguing. You were real, like all that shit, man. Those are the kind of people I, I, I like appreciate watching. That. In the characters I, I get into, that. whatever you want to call them. Um, I appreciate that. I thought you, I thought you're fucking awesome, Rip, Rip Rogers, Rip Rogers, and my dad both said this to me. My dad said it to me about life, and Rip said it to me about wrestling. And so did and Road Dog. Road Dog was one of the guys back at, at TNA that explained this to me and Wolfie when we were kind of getting, you know, getting uh, rung through the coals a little bit in the office. All three of them basically said, you know, life is insane. On the best of days, you can't make heads or tails of it. You just got to go along with it and roll with the punches. Rip said that about, you know, pro wrestling. Uh, Road Dog said that about press pro wrestling. My dad said that about life. Uh, I, I remember Road Dog saying, you know, wrestling sometimes is like a, an abusive spouse. All you do is love it. and All it does is beat you up. And just when you, you know, you're about to get out. It, 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 it blinks its eyes at you and, and it kisses you on the cheek and says, come on back in. I'll never, I'll never beat you again. And then you get back in the house and then it beats you up again. And so for the love of the game, you stick around in that abusive relationship. And I tell all the kids, I try to say it really nice to the young guys. I go, look, you know, wrestling, you know, we owe it everything. It owes us nothing. So enjoy the ride. You know, whether you're getting a piece of tin or whether you're getting a push or whether you're whatever you're doing, you know, you get to put smiles on faces travel the world put smiles on faces and i don't, I don't know what uh better of reward is that anything else it's gravy awesome man hey um we're gonna finish this thing up tell people uh tell people about your school where to find you where to follow you all that good stuff get 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 some good plugs in here oh cool thank you oh thank you i appreciate that so uh, all of my social media is sin bodhi s-i-n-n-b-o-d-h-i -N -N -I, sin with two n's bodhi like the tree Bodhi, like Bodhisattva from uh, Buddhist. It means Bodhi means without hate, fear, or delusion. Which I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm probably jam packed with all three of those things. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> my my social media is S I N N Bodhi, like the tree. My my uh, Instagram, my my Facebook, my Twitter, and my uh, Snake Pit page is uh is on Facebook. You can find it. You can always just scroll down on, on any of my social media stuff. And if promoters want me to wrestle or do a seminar, I'm happy to do it. I love uh, love entertaining the fans, and uh, there you go, man. I just I love this shit, and I love being able to wrestle with the the, the up and coming uh, wrestlers and, and give back just a little bit, man. Again, like Rip said at the beginning of this chat, you know, coaching and seeing people's light bulbs, you know, light bulbs ping off, seeing people get it, and you know, if you leave leave them a little piece of you and leave them a little piece of pro wrestling, then I think we 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 did our industry proud. No, I just enjoyed listening to his story and it brings back memories. And I said, well, I mean, I think I remember a little bit of this, <laughs> a little bit of that, but, uh, it's great that somebody that come under your wing, they made it, got, they got to make a career out of this and it's not about the money. It's just about being happy of doing what you want to do. Uh, this was your dream was to be a pro wrestler. And that was mine. I didn't, I didn't give a shit about being a major league baseball player or a football player or, or anything else. I just wanted to be a pro wrestler and to get in it and to survive and to be in the business in any capacity for this long, I can't ever bitch about anything. This is the only thing I wanted to do. And I was half-assed fucking crazy. And I didn't know anybody else that had aspirations like that. Because I was looking at the UHF station, getting the antenna out and adjusting it to watch Dick the Bruiser wrestling or the Sheiks wrestling or All-Star Championship wrestling out of, or Paducah All-Star wrestling or Nick Goulash wrestling out of goddamn Louisville. And then all of a sudden, 45 years later, I'm still involved in this shit. So 46 year, whatever the hell it was. But I'm just so proud of what you've become, how I got to be a Thank you. A, a little part of, of your life. And I feel now that I helped you a little bit. I never tried to hinder anybody. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to teach them survival skills because this is an ugly, vicious world. Yes, and, sir. and pro wrestling is stick a knife in somebody's back, especially if they're fucking good. The old so Tennessee backpat, right? 
What's that? The old Tennessee backpat. Yeah. Okay. Looking, looking for the <laughs> <laughs> looking for the soft spot, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, I just wanted to I just wanted to thank you for being on the show. No, thank you, Rip. I appreciate and, you, man. I love you. You you have taught me so much. And, and it's funny. Uh, on, a, on a small side note, before we get out of here. I can't tell you how many 60 minute Broadways I do with students courtesy of you. I mean, you taught me that art and I, I've, I've related to, to, you know, uh, students that are uh, up to the challenge along the way. And I kind of tell them it's sort of our, sort of our, uh, wrestling, uh, rite of passage. It's not going to yeah. get you a job per se, but the guys that know how to do it will appreciate, you know? And so I always do that with, I had so many kids where they're, I've literally done a couple back to back where the kids are like, how the fuck did you do that? I'm like, oh, I know how to work. Thanks, yeah. Rip Rogers. Thank you, Rip Rogers. You know, but but like you said, I'm 100% in agreement. Wrestling is is all that I love. It it feeds my family. And anytime I do ever uh, sell a bit at home, my wife just looks at me and she kind of shakes me and just goes, "Hey," she goes, uh, uh, "Do you have a boss that you answer to?" And I said, "No, ma'am." She goes, "Do you feed your family uh, uh, by putting on those wrestling boots?" I said, "Yes, ma'am." She goes, "Good. Shut the fuck up. Life is good." <laughs> I say, "Yes, ma'am." <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, that is great. That's awesome, man. Hey, what do you got today? You're doing a seminar, you said, right? Isn't that what you're doing there today? Are you, yeah, you I'm wrestling do a sem too? Seminar or? and a show. Yeah, I'm and just uh, just outside of. Uh, we're about an hour hour and change outside of Memphis. Uh, we're going oh, to cool. Sherwood, Arkansas. So check it out. All the information is on my Facebook page, on my Instagram page, on my Twitter page, and. Um, uh, you can go buy tickets. You can come to the door and buy tickets at the door. I, th I think you can get, there's an online link. I'm pretty sure. Yep. Yeah, there is. Yep. Yep. There's an online link. Uh, awesome, come and man. see me, come and meet me. Uh, happy to talk to you. Happy to talk wrestling with all you good folks out there. Uh, I'm ready to put smiles on faces and I am ready to beat the dog shiznit out of some unfortunate Arkansas wrestler. And it's going to be my privilege because I'm coming in it well-armed courtesy of Rip Rogers. All right, man. It don't get any better than Don't that. get any better than that. Sin Bodie, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Thank man. You, boys. Appreciate it. Thank you, boys. Thank you. Love you, Rip. Be safe. You, You're have, awesome, man. Have a good day. Thank you very you too. much. You too. Yeah. Big gold and a bill fold. So swole that I can't get the shit closed. So I money fold and rubber band wrap. And when it pops.